here, and uh, thank you so much for that wonderful uh, communion talk and, and thought, John, and I know the whole you're talking about, because the last time that I went out, I eagled it by myself, so it was great. <laughs> 1979, Bette Midler recorded a song that captured the heart of a nation, and to date is one of the fastest rising songs of all time. In fact, it hit number one on not only the pop chart, but the adult contemporary chart and the country music chart all at one time. And of course, the song is The Rose. And it was a song that she found from a little-known artist, and she said it was a song about her life. She wanted to sing it. So Happy Hands you know, group, get, get ready. Here are some of the lyrics from it. Some say love, it is a river that drowns the tender reed. Some say love, it is a razor that leaves your soul to bleed. Some say love, it's a hunger, an endless aching need. It's the heart afraid of breaking that never learns to dance. It's the dream afraid of waking that never takes a chance. It's the one who won't be taken, who cannot seem to give, and the soul afraid of dying that never learns to live. They asked her years later why her song had remained popular um, and one of the most popular songs of all time for, generation, for a whole generation. She said, the song had raw emotion and it puts into words pain and longing felt by so many people and it offers them hope. And that's what we're about, is offering people hope. We are starting a new sermon series today in, entitled Life in Community. Life in Community. What, what are we talking about? Because each of us are a part of communities all the time. I mean, think about where you live, whether it's in South Huntsville or over in Hampton Cove or out in the county somewhere or in Madison. Maybe you're part of, you know, the community there and the Civic Association. And, of course, some of you guys go to school and, and out to college and everything. And there are communities of people there that we interact with. I mean, these are the people we see at PTA that we see on the, on the bleachers and see at different activities. And that's kind of a community that we interact in. Work is a community. We see the same people day in and day out. We, we go on, on business trips with them. We're, we're a part of a project. And it seems to work better and, and work is more efficient if you're working together as one unit within a community. And you think about sports or, or a play. If you're a part of a cast or, or different hobbies that either we're a part of or our children are a part of, you, you join part of a community. And so you interact with the same people. And if you're a parent on a team, well, then, you know, you have to carpool. And, and you get, uh, this week, I'll get the root beer and orange slices. And, and, and so you work together to make that activity happen. Also think of online communities. You know, the people are very active in blogs and, and Facebook and following one another on, on Twitter, whatever that is. And then you've got FaceTime and, and podcasts and, and Skype and, and, and YouTube and what it does is it allows us to have the world literally at our fingertips. And so we can connect with people on the other side of the globe. And it's, it's just incredible. So we're around people all the time, right? Ironically, we've never been more disconnected than we are right now. Discouragement, depression, and, and feelings of hopelessness and isolation are at all-time highs according to the studies. Well, why? Why if we're around people and we're connected and, and we find ourselves in different communities all the time going from one to another, do we feel somehow disconnected and alone? Well, the answer is, while we may intermingle with others throughout the day and week, are we experiencing true community? Often it remains the elusive gold ring, the, the thing that Man, if, if I could just get in with that group, boy, I, I want to be a part of that community. And, and my heart, this, this aching that's within me, somehow that need's going to be satisfied if I can just get a group of friends around me. If, if I can be accepted and, and, and brought into to that fellowship. And so that becomes the thing. But sometimes we, we think we're part of a group. And for, for 16 Saturdays, you can sit with the same people on sidelines 
But when the season's over and the team disbands, what happens to those relationships? They're gone. How, how about this? Do you work for a decade next to a person in the cubicle where either if you take another position or if they leave, sometimes that relationship travels with them. You're, you're thinking, I spent a big portion of my life with this person and I, I thought we had some friendship and community. I guess that was just part of the job that wasn't true, authentic community. Let me guess, preacher, you're going to say, well, you've got to come to church. Well, maybe, but for, for some people, the answer to that is no thanks. Because when you talk about being a part of a church or, or coming to church, what they think about is what we're doing right now. Sitting in a, a gathering, an auditorium, and kind of doing a worship service. And author Tom Schultz identified characteristics of people that get a kick out of doing what we're doing right now and being part of a church service. And he calls these people the church incline. These are the people that love church, never miss. Well, who are these people? He said, number one, they're audience-driven. They're audience-oriented. They appreciate a good presentation from the stage. Uh, they prefer to passively listen uh, to the paid professionals up on stage to watch them do their thing. And it's similar to going to the theater. And, and you kind of, when you walk out, you kind of, it's like going to the theater. Well, what'd you think? Well, I was slightly engaged, and, uh, you know, I was entertained, so thumbs up. Or, man, I, I just didn't connect, and so it's kind of thumbs down this week. We'll, we'll give them their shot next week. So they're audience-oriented, okay? The, the, the other thing he said is many of the church inclined are anonymously positioned. They enjoy being part of a large church so they can kind of blend in, a faceless person in the crowd. And it doesn't bother them to slip in, kind of experience something, and slip out. Don't bother with me. Don't make us stand up and connect with people because I just assume you do your thing and I'll sit here and do my thing. They also seem to be authority-centered, that those in charge can provide the information and inspiration that they're looking for in life. So they, they count on paid professionals to communicate insights and to move them and pray for them and do the work that they know needs to be done in the kingdom and they can somehow connect in with that without ever having to completely engage. Tom Schultz also said that they're academic minded that they see the church as an educator of sorts in, in faith-related matters. And so you come, and, and they're willing to come once a week to obtain information about theological principles and historical data. He said also those that have a propensity of coming to church, he said quite a few are auditory gifted, meaning that the ears and, and, and taking things in through that and processing through that sense works for them. And so they can learn a lot by listening and through that experience. Okay, if that's the church incline, who's the rest? Who's the church decline? Well, here's what he said. He said, audience-oriented? No, spirituality for many people is not a spectator sport. They don't want to see themselves on the sidelines. They want to know more about God, but they don't see how sitting in an auditorium can connect them with God. Anonymous? When it comes to matters of the heart, they want to connect with people. If I'm going to be pursuing God, I want to kind of connect with some other people that are kind of on, on a journey as well. And so I crave connections. And telling my story is just as important as you hearing and, and me hearing about what you're talking about. So they really don't respond to one-way communication. They prefer a dialogue back and forth. What about authority? I'd rather connect with God and have a, a spiritual conversation with friends at Starbucks than coming into a lecture hall. Well, a academic? Well, you know what? I've got all the, on the, on the internet, I can find all the information I'm looking for, and I can process it myself. I don't need you to chew the food for me. I'll, I'll just go get what I need. What about auditory? Less than one-third of people say that that is their most dominant way of learning is through listening. And so a lot of people just say, you know what, if, if, if that's what it means to be a part of a church, ah, count me out. So when we talk about going to church, I, I wonder sometimes, 
if we're way undershooting things when we talk about a service? Is that what Jesus died for? Ephesians 5.25 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So perhaps just showing up on, on Sundays, you know, from 10 to 11.15, if the preacher would get off the stage, it is not the full measure of what Jesus had in mind and the whole purpose of the church. Well, praise be the Lord that he's called us to something different. He's called us to something deeper than what many have, have made it and have limited it to be. And so that's what I want us to do. I, I want us to kind of look at this over the next few weeks. So he's inviting us to claim a community that's different than any other communi community that we're going to engage in throughout the week or throughout our lifetimes. It's a community that's based on the teachings and the life and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And because of that, it's going to be unique. It's going to be special. It's going to have traits that other groups simply can't measure up to. So we're going to look at this, that it's a community that's based on covenant and calling. And I hope that we can get a, a better understanding of what the bride of Christ is supposed to be and get a glimpse of what Jesus had in his mind because him coming and establishing this changes everything. If you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, this is a very familiar story, but I, I hope that we can gain kind of an insight as to what the Lord had in mind, some of his priorities that are going to be put in place after he returns in his ascension. We find out in John chapter 4 that the Pharisees have finally put Jesus on their radar. They know something's up. He's gaining popularity, and it gets them nervous. And in fact, things are starting to boil a little bit and they're asking questions and there's some irritation there. And Jesus said, it's early on in my ministry. I know this confrontation's coming. Not right now. Boys, let's, let's go on a road trip. And so they decide that they're going to leave from Judea and they're going to go back up in, into Galilee. Verse 4 tells us as they're heading north, now he had to go through Samaria. Well, if you look on this map, geographically, it makes sense just to go straight north from Jerusalem up, up towards Sychar. But it's not to shave off time off the route. There was a reason why he chose not to do the big loop that the Jews chose to do, crossing over the Jordan. And sometimes at flood stage, this is very dangerous. But they would rather risk dying in the Jordan River than to step foot in Samaria. But Jesus says, I've got to go up there, and we're going to go this way. So you can just imagine, as they're heading outside Jerusalem, and maybe a few of the, the disciples were ahead of Jesus, and they start heading this way. And then they kind of look back, and they see in their, oh, Jesus is going, we, we never go this way. I know, let's just follow him, see what's going on. But he, he's going to be doing something different. And so by going straight, Heading straight north, Jesus is proclaiming, my community is different. You've been told that following God is this. You've been told that we only do things with this people. We, it, things are going to be different. You've got to get ready. Because I'm ushering in something that's completely different. Matthew describes it as he's ushering the kingdom of, of, of heaven. Mark says the kingdom of God. Luke says it's the coming of the Spirit. And John says it's life eternal that he's, he's bringing in. It's something none of us have experienced. Uh, it, the law has been passed down to Moses, and it's kind of gotten warped over the years. We've kind of gotten in this rut, and we're not feeling good about our relationship with God. Jesus says, Let's put that on the shelf and try something new. This is going to be different. If, if you have your Bibles, turn, turn over to Matthew. Keep your, your hand here. But turn to Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Because there's this new covenant in that's going to be made possible by Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection. But I want us to draw this distinction here. Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6 says this. These 12, after he gets them all together, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. 
do not go among the Gentiles or any or enter any town of the Samaritans. Rather go to the lost sheep of Israel. Why is this passage here? And John has something else to, to share. Well, if, if you believe theologians that, that Mark was probably written first and, and Matthew was early on as well, what was the focus of the ministry at that time? Well, the believers were largely the Jewish people. And the gospel, according to Acts chapter 11 and verse 19, was preached only to the Jews. And so people have this gospel of Matthew that they've been reading. And so maybe there were some Christians in the church that John is trying to reach. And they're saying, see, there's a reason why we still keep this border up. Jesus said the message is only for the Jews. Well, John is written at a much later date. And John's like, I've got a story for you guys. I, I, I want to set the record straight on this and how we're supposed to be living as a community. And so John says in, in, in chapter 3 of his gospel that Jesus, you're, you Jews are absolutely right, Jesus is ministering right there in the epicenter in Jerusalem. The Gentiles. Here's a message for you. One chapter later, he walks right into the heart of the Gentile territory right there in Samaria audience you got to know things are going to be different in our church that's what he's telling them and for us it things are supposed to be different in what we experience here than what we experience out in the world it's supposed to be radically different this group isn't supposed to be politically correct we can say what the bible says and call it truth amen we can do things that the world says you can't say oh yes we can we're going to be a community that's different that, that looks a whole lot different than the communities we experience out there. It, it's not going to be business as usual. It should not fall in line with the patterns of this world. Our community should be a detour, a radical de detour off the well-worn path that everyone else in the world is following. This community should look different. Let's read more in this story in John chapter 4, starting in verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Interesting. Last week we talked about that Israel means what? Struggler. And he said, I'm about to struggle with someone that isn't from the line of Abraham. Just thought that was interesting. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And it was about the sixth hour. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy some food, and the Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. God let you know, a little disclaimer. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans, John adds. By his actions, Jesus is demonstrating my community is going to be inclusive. It is. It's going to be inclusive. It's going to be open to a whole lot of people. What better way to, to model the grace of God than be radically inclusive? Let, let's go back to John 3. Who's he reaching out to? He's reaching out to a male and, and, and part of the religious establishment in Nicodemus. Someone that's got it together. And, and someone that maybe needs to look at faith a little bit different. And then right after this, he goes and talks with a Samaritan woman of shame, not this man of prominence. By this conversation as well, Jesus is telling us Gentiles are welcome as Jews. Women are welcome as well as men. And those that think they've got it together are, are, are going to be right alongside those that absolutely know they need Jesus and know they don't have it together. We're all going to be mixed up together. Authentic community intended by Jesus should be an oasis for those that are cast off by the world around us. And look, you run into cast offs throughout your day. They should find their way to this church. Teens get rejected at school should long for Wednesday night. Don't, don't you kind of want to be back with a youth group? Be back with people that love you and accept you for who you are, warts and all. And you're like, man, I, I want to be part of that group because I face rejection throughout the day. 
That should be what we're looking for. The brokenhearted should find comfort. The world desperately needs and desires. It, it tries to divide people according to race. It tries to divide people a, a, according to uh, gender and political parties and, and talents and age and, and finance. Praise be the Lord, we've got all kinds of folks that come here. And we're, we're, in, we're encouraged to kind of run with people that kind of fit us and are like-minded and, and kind of shop at the same places and look kind of like we do and, and act the same we do and have the same. He says, no, it, it's going to be a hodgepodge here. And it's going to be inclusive. Our community is going to look different. We're going to find people that look different than us, that vote different than us, that live differently, but we have in common Jesus Christ and a need for him. John 4 and verse 10 says this, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have anything to, to draw with and well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and, and drank from it himself? As did his sons and, and flocks and herds. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Whoever drinks water I give him will never thirst. He, the water I give him, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What he's pointing her to is the reality that my community is eternal. You run across thirsty people, people that keep returning to the same dry well and you know they're empty, people that bounce from one relationship to another, because there's a void there and they can't stand to be apart. They, they've got to be connected with someone even if that person is not good for them. They're thirsty. You see people that their life is, is coming unraveled but they're still climbing the, the, the corporate ladder and you just want to say, stop. Stop. Come home to your family. They desperately need you. But that person's thirsty. And you want to tell them, I've experienced something different. I, I, I want to point you towards something that's eternal, something that you can't get out into the world. And that's what Jesus is saying is, we spend so much time running after the things that, that we're worried about through doing this. He said, all of that is in this world. Think of the world to come. Think of the things that will last. Think of the things that you can't provide for yourself. My community is eternal. Many of the groupings we're a part throughout the uh, life are temporary. If you think about it, we get put in different groups. If you've ever been a part of a jury, you may spend a tremendous amount of time with them. The trial's over. You never see those folks again. You, you think of classes at school you spend day after day after day. And how many of you connect with people from high school? Did you went through school all the way? How many of you still go back and, and connect? No. I mean, a lot of those relationships just don't. You have workout groups. You have different hobbies and things we spend so much time with. But they were never designed to last. They were never designed to be eternal because they weren't doing anything to draw us closer. So they're, they're just temporary. So Jesus is calling us to partner with other believers in him, a community that's focused on the eternal. He says, come to me and this living water will sustain you through this life and point you to the next. We're going to talk more about the church in Corinth because I think we can learn a lot from it. But it's interesting because it's a very dysfunctional church. How does Paul open that letter? And we'll talk about this later. But in the first chapter, he says, before we get into some of the stuff you guys are struggling with, let's go back and talk about the cross. I want, to, I want to talk about the cross because the reason we're all together is we have a need that we can't satisfy. We need the blood of Jesus. And then he moves over here to chapter 15. He says, as I'm wrapping this up, and we've talked about all these things, you need a motivation for doing some of the things I'm suggesting. How about the resurrection? Let's get a clear understanding of the resurrection and where we're heading. Because if we know, if we know the pit that we were taken out of by Jesus Christ, and, and we understand the life that he's calling us to is eternal and on that side, some of this other stuff kind of works its way out. I love how Roger talked about we need a little grace. Absolutely. And if we understand that we're all on the same level because of what cross of, of Christ has given us, and we all know where we're heading, 
and what God's calling us to, it makes it easier to extend His grace. Well, we're kind of working here and having this conversation, and Jesus asked her about her husband. The woman did her best to gloss over her past, but Jesus revealed she had been married for five times and was her current fellow she was with. Well, it wasn't her husband. So she immediately starts changing the subject here. You guys know this story. This is a woman asked, you know, whether it's okay if we worship here on, on Mount Gerizim, you know, where Abraham and Jacob had worshipped, because that, that's kind of where we go, or do we have to believe what the Jews are telling us that it doesn't count unless you go down to Jerusalem? And Jesus says neither. John 4 and verse 23 says, Yet a time is coming now, it has now come when, when true worshipers will fellowship, will worship with the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. This is the last thing I want to bring up. We're going to bring up other qualities of the community. The last one is my community is spirit-filled. He said, you're about to experience something that you've never seen before. And you'll never see in any of the communities you experience in this world is God coming down and indwelling and being a part of us. He said, that's coming. And when it does, it's going to blow you away. And you're going to experience something that's just truly incredible. Authentic community will not make sense in the world around us because it's not of this world. It's one of the coolest parts of being a believer for me is kind of seeing how God's hand works and how the Spirit gets involved in our lives. How many of you ever been in a hospital waiting room or in a doctor's office and the doctor comes in he's kind of scratching his head and he said, I can't explain it, but the tumor that we were kind of worried about and we're watching, it's totally gone. Science can't really help us out here. Don't know. And you just start grinning, don't you? Because you know what's been going on. God says, I want to display what I'm able to do here. I love it when you hear stories about wardens that don't understand. When parents can walk in to visit an inmate that took the life of their child. And the warden thinks, there's no reason this person should be here. There's no reason this person should be loving. They should be hating and despising and rejoicing that this person is either locked up for life or is heading towards being killed. And the warden just doesn't understand, but we understand that there's a higher calling you know, I, I think of other things that, that we see. I remember one Sunday morning watching about 10 minutes into a service, someone come walking down the aisle, and I happened to be up front. This is our, our church in Houston. It wasn't uncommon for people to come in a little late, and that, that was fine. But as the person got closer, I had only seen pictures of her. I hadn't seen her myself because I'd been there about seven years. But I understood who it was. It was a daughter of this empty nest couple that had been estranged for 10 years. She looked rough. She did. She had been taken advantage of. Drugs had been in her life and men that had, had abused her. And she had totally cut off contact from her parents. And this was a prodigal coming back. And watching that couple's eyes, because I saw her like a bride coming down before her parents knew what was going on. And watching her mother just collapse in her seat, just weeping. And I'm like, that's what I want to be about. A community of people that's reconciling. A community of people that, that those in the world just don't understand and can't make the connection. They don't understand what's happening, but we know it's of God. There's nothing that we can that we can do of our own. By the power of the Spirit, we witness addicts come clean. By the power of the Spirit, when a marriage counselor says, this thing is done, and then to have a couple come back and reconcile, that's not of them, it's of God. And we celebrate that. We love it when felons find faith. It's a church for which Christ came to establish, and there's something there that's magical. There's something there that, that God says, this is going to be a mini revelation 
of the kingdom that's going to happen. My kingdom, the things that are happening in heaven are going to start happening on earth. It's, it's, it's just a taste. It's an appetizer of the life to come. But we bear witness to that. And we experience that. And we tell people about this thing that we call church. It's not just coming for worship for an hour and 15 minutes. It's authentic community. And if you haven't experienced that, hunger for it. Search for it. Let's look at Scripture and say, what are some of the markers of it so that we can have that, not just for us, but so it can be a carrier of the gospel message that has been entrusted to us, and we bear witness to what that message has done for each one of us. A.W. Tozer says this, the true Christian experience must always include a genuine encounter with God. Without this, religion is but a shadow a reflection of reality, a cheap copy of an original once enjoyed by someone else of whom we have heard. It cannot be, it cannot but be a major tragedy in life of any man to live in a church from childhood to old age and know nothing more real than some synthetic God compounded of, of theology and logic but having no eyes to see no ears to hear and no heart to love that's a tragedy i don't want us to experience that i want us to experience the kind of community that we see here laid out in scripture that jesus christ died for us let's not settle for anything less let's hunger for community let's pray together lord i i pray that as we look at this story of the woman of the well and how shocking it must have been to those that originally heard this story. Lord, let it shock us. Lord, may it, it, it drive us to seek after the kind of community that you had in mind. Lord, give us ears to hear the cries of desperation for those longing for relationship. Lord, give us the hearts to love others, especially those that are hard to love and have been cast off by others. Lord, help us to love them as you have loved us. Lord, help us to do all these things to glorify your name and become more like Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.